I've always been interested in games that have a strong narrative. My interest for were games and for fantasy games, adventure games, dungeon crawlers, stamp society from that. Games that have a strong narrative. Um, and recently I started to look uh, more closely into the history of, I shouldn't say the genre, but I should say the style, the specific approach. Looking uh, at old games that started developing the idea of players playing individual heroes, individual characters in very well individualized world with mechanics that would match uh, the theme and that would give the players a sense of immersion, a, a sense of becoming a hero in a parallel world, etc, etc, etc. Games where the sequence of decisions and the sequence of events in the game built a sort of experience that could be comparable to that of, of a narrative type of experience. In my search for such games, I stumble upon uh, two games called Survival and The Barbarian. Both games originally appeared in the White Dwarf magazine, and later they were republished by Task Force Games as a double game pack, as you can see here. The first, Survival, is a sci-fi game, as you can see clearly, and depending on the scenario, you are strand stranded on an alien planet, or you are decided to go on that alien planet hunting for animals. If you were stranded, then the animals are merely hunting for you. Either way, it is about you traveling across a map and trying to defeat uh, the weird alien beasts that you encounter along the way. In the Barbarian, you are the fantasy barbarian warrior of the title, and your mission is to travel in this fairly generic fantasy world and retrieve magic artifacts. And if you can do that and be alive, you will. You win the game. Uh, of notice is the fact that the Barbarian uh, was designed by Ian Livingstone, the same guy who will then will go on and become one of the co-creators of the fa fighting fantasy series. So that's interesting that early on we have a game where already he's experimenting with this idea of uh, turning the player into a fantasy hero that will travel through a pile of fantasy world, uh, complete missions and adventures, etc. At the time, also in the late 70s, uh, he, together with, uh, with Steve Jackson, was one of the distributors of Dungeons and Dragons in the UK. So. Uh, you can see the connection there. So yes, very important to remember. I mentioned this, this game is by Ian Livingstone, but it's the UK Ian Livingstone, not the American one. So, um, Survival and The Barbarian. Two games uh, from back then um, that now you can find easily on, on eBay in this double package here. I play them. Uh, solitaire, frankly, both games are, one of them is Solitaire Friendly Survival and Barbarian is mainly for Solitaire. I play them and today I'm going to tell a little bit about them. Let's start with Survival and then we'll talk about Barbarian. Survival. This game has several scenarios that have slightly different rules and different objectives. Uh, we'll start by talking about the basic scenario, which is a solitaire scenario. And the scenario, you start on one of those six locations, which is determined randomly with a die roll. You place the counter representing your cart in the corresponding area, and your goal is to reach the research station. In this scenario, you Cry, your, your ship crashed on this planet and now you're trying to make it through various obstacles and impervious terrain and hostile beasts uh, trying to reach the abandoned research station where you can send a signal and ask for help. This can be played as a competitive game with multiple players trying to make it here because it turns out in that case that there is only enough food to support to support one person for the time it takes for help to arrive. So only one person will make it. The first person that gets there locks himself in and too bad for the other people. Um, it can be a different type of scenario. You will encounter hostile beasts on the board, but there can be a different scenario in which actually you went on the planet of your own volition to hunt those beasts. So that's a competitive scenario where the point is to, to score enough points by capturing beasts before the opponents do. So different type of things. There's another one in which you are trying to rescue a companion that is confusedly, uh, aimlessly moving around the board and then you use this area of the board here to determine random direction of the poor lost guy and you're trying to, to find him. In any case, let's talk about the basic idea which is pretty much the same in all in all scenarios. So, uh, the game is divided in turns, you keep track of the turns using that player aid there, there we have the 
turn track in the basic scenario well in all in all scenarios uh, the turns are divided in days you have a morning turn uh, in a afternoon turn followed by a night turn the day turns work in the same way in the basic scenario then during the night turn nothing happens all that happens is to recover a wound point in case you lost some in case you lost health and there is there an area of the player that you use to keep track of your wound status uh, you start with six points you can go down to zero as you can see you have multiple tracks here for multiple characters. In the basic game you're trying to make it to the research center alive and before the end of the sixth day if you meet those two conditions you win the game and you lose the game if you're still lost in somewhere on the planets by the end of day six or if you lose by reaching zero points before the um, well, before you can win the game. So if you die by reaching zero points that also is a loss. At the beginning of the game you also select some weapons that you are carrying with you. Uh, weapons have different weight values, so there is a certain amount of, let's say, weight points, weight units that you can carry. Weapons include a light sword, think about that, how original is that? We have a laser carbine, we have an auto pistol, there are other weapons such as the spear, the flamethrower. Better weapons are heavier. So you will probably want to have a combination of different weapons. And different weapons have different uh, starting amount of points, of ammo points. For example, the pistol here has 10 ammo points. Uh, the lightsaber, oh, I mean the light sword, has 6. It is the value printed there. As you can see, there are also numbers there that indicates the attack value, the combat value of the weapon. Most weapons only have a ranged weapon, a range value or a melee value. The auto pistol is the only one that has both. So you have a number and a letter that indicates in which phase of combat you can use it. And each time that you use a weapon, you will spend an ammo point or part of the charge of the light sword, I guess, and when the value goes down to zero, the weapon becomes useless. So back to us, what happens uh, each turn, uh, each day segment uh, is pretty simple. You move and if, or I should say when you encounter beasts, uh, you fight. So you move spending your movement allowance. You have a movement allowance of six points. So the number of movement points that you spend depends on the terrain that you enter. And you need to keep track of how many points you spent because movement will be most likely interrupted by combat and there are no tracks on the board to keep track of that. So maybe you use a die or other systems to keep track. Each time that you enter a new hex, you need to roll to see if you encounter an enemy and you roll on that table there that you see there with the terrain effect chart and animal encounter table. Here you have the movement points that it costs to enter the terrain. Each time that you enter a new axe, you roll a die. If you roll one or two, nothing happens. If you roll three, four, five or six, you encounter an animal and the codes for that animal you obtain by cross-reference the terrain that you're in with the result that you that you uh, obtain. So if you encounter an enemy, a monster, a beast, it will be identified by a letter. Then you go down in this section here and you have a table that tells you the stats of each monster. Uh, each monster is identified by a letter. Here you have the name just for some chrome or flavor. You have a defense value and a melee value. Now when you encounter a beast, if you have a ranged weapon, then you can attack the beast with a ranged weapon. And if the beast is still alive at the end of the round of range combat, then you have a round of melee combat. Range combat, you only do it, so you got a chance of attacking first. Melee combat, if you get there, if you're forced to get there because you don't have a ranged weapon, uh, it's simultaneous, so both you and your enemy get to attack each other during that round of combat. Um, how does it work? Uh, pretty simple. When you, when someone is attacking, you during range, you and your opponent during melee combat, you want to die for each person that is fighting, each creature that is fighting, and you add the weapon value for that type of combat. If you're firing during your range, during your range uh, combat, 
round, then you add the range value. If you are attacking during the melee phase, then you add the melee value, the weapon that you're using. The enemy is only attacking melee, so they always only use their melee value. As I said, you roll a die, you attack whatever is the combat value that applies to the situation. If the modified result is equal to or higher than the defense value of the creature that you're attacking, or your own, which is of 9, the creature or yourself gets a wound. In the basic game, you get to kill each monster, each beast that you encounter by inflicting a single wound. In the advanced game, you use the, you may use the optional rule uh, to have a certain number of wounds and you need to inflict that many wounds on your opponent uh, to be able to eliminate the opponent. And again, there is no way of keeping track of that, so keep a sheet of paper or again, use dice to keep track of how many wounds your enemies still have. Because then you're fighting, you have several rounds of combat, because in the advanced game you get stuck in melee and you keep fighting against one of the two, you or the beast is not there, one of the two is, is eliminated. So you have to keep track of that and after a while you go back to the board because you may still have some movement points that you haven't spent and really there's no way at that point that you remember how many points you spent or you have to reconstruct it, etc, etc. So you have to keep track of movement points and wound points of the enemies uh, somehow to facilitate gameplay. If you're playing the advanced game where there are multiple possible rounds of combat, there's also a rule that allows you to attempt to escape. Uh, you may be able to escape completely so you do not have to fight and you keep moving or maybe you do not get to fight but you do not move um, that for the rest of the turn you spent that time and there are several other optional rules that you can choose to to adopt for example you may rest more uh, get, regaining one point so not only during your night turn but in that case you uh, are you're spending time uh, you may choose to make to consider some of the animals as edible in which case you gain extra time because well you have food there to support you uh, there may be stashes of weapons that are left around and you need to find them and if you find them then you get an advantage because you get more weapons and more ammo. There really are, is a good degree of customization. The game is super simple, mind you, uh, but it can be customized in a variety of ways. Let's talk about Barbarian now. Here you see the map for the game Barbarian, printed on paper, not particularly pretty, but definitely functionally in the sense there is no ambiguity uh, between different types of terrain. Very encyclopedic representation of terrain, trying to portray many different types of terrain in clearly divided blocks with some strange effects such as swamps being adjacent to the desert and with this road conveniently crossing. Uh, the land and touching all terrains. Now, when you're setting up the game, first the monster player will place the counters representing the monsters. Each type of terrain only has one monster, and the type of monster can only move in that terrain. So we have zombies in the steppes, wraiths in the desert, wild men of the hills on the hills. And in the game, each monster will only be, each creature, each enemy will only be allowed to move within the starting terrain. So the creature player places their creatures in the terrain, making sure that the monsters do not cover those hexes there that have numbers on them. I also ruled that the monsters cannot be placed on the names of the terrain because it just looks weird otherwise. The monsters should be played in such a way that they are protecting the hexes with the numbers even though it's unclear at that point of the setup which hexes will be important for reasons that I will explain in a second. If you are playing by yourself as a solitaire player then you place the monsters in the same fashion, again, trying to think that the monsters are trying to protect, protect, protect the hexes. Then you take these six counters here, you shuffle them face down as a Soiter player, and you place one for each type of terrain, rolling a die to determine the exact location. For example, here I rolled a die for this area, I rolled a four, I took one of these counters randomly and I placed it there. If you are playing the creature player in the two player game, then you get to choose which counter goes in which area, but within each area you still need to roll to determine the exact location uh, within that area. 
Then you roll two d6s for the starting location of the Barbarian, which is represented by that counter, and you place the Barbarian on the road on the number corresponding to the uh, result of the roll. Now, as for monsters, creatures, and things like that, uh, talking about the stats, you may see that these counters have microscopic numbers printed on them. There is a number in the top left corner, which is the defense number, represents the number that the opponent needs to roll against and needs to exceed or match to be able to inflict a wound against that enemy. In the bottom right corner you see a number that represents the movement number. For, for the monsters that is simply the number of hexes that they move. Uh, since they only move in one type of terrain, then the, the movement allowance already factors the type of terrain in. The Barbarian doesn't have a movement allowance printed on the counter for some reason, but the movement allowance is of 8, but the Barbarian spends different amounts of movement points depending on the terrain that the Barbarian is moving in. The top right corner tells us the number of hit points, health points, life points that the creature has when that number goes on to zero because of wound that had been inflicted. The uh, character is removed from the game and you keep track of the current state of health of each character using that player rate that you see there. You simply move the counter each time that a character takes a hit. The Barbarian starts with 20 hit points or health points. Uh, the Barbarian may start with 25 if an optional rule is added, which is an optional rule that I like and that I play with, which is an optional rule that allows you to add extra monsters, extra creatures. There are five possible extra enemies that are road encounters. So when the Barbarian moves on the road, you roll a die, and if you roll one or two, there is a random encounter, then you roll under the table to determine which of these monsters, such as the dragon, for example, or the evil barbarian and the troll, you will encounter, and in which case you have to resolve at least a round of combat before you can move away. So what happens here for turn structure? It's a pretty typical war game turn structure. Movement combat for one player, movement combat for the other player. The Barbarian starts, uh, goes first, so in each turn you will have first movement and possibly combat for the Barbarian. The Barbarian moves and spends movement points uh, as he goes and can move into different types of terrain. Then the Barbarian can attack adjacent enemies, if there is an adjacent enemy then the opponent can move and attack. Now, um, there isn't, during combat, you get to attack and the attacker doesn't get to attack back. So if you're the, attack play, the, the active player, you attack, you're done. If then the opponent is the active player, the opponent moves and attacks, resolves the attack, and that's it. Which means that there really is an incentive for the Barbarian to attack, because if you're starting adjacent to an enemy, in any case, what you're trying to do is to retrieve one of these to retrieve these artifacts, the point in the game for the Barbarian is to find two special items hidden under these face-down counters. So if I'm there, there is really no advantage for me in attacking because then I'm forfeiting my movement because in the standard uh, turn structure it is movement and then combat. So I will always running, I will always run and the opponents will always attack me. Only in some cases I may consider attack. Uh, so actually I ruled to make the game a little more interesting that the Barbarian can attack before, after or during movement. In this case, in that situation it could attack and then run. I have a little more um, options and there's a little more strategy that way. But the standard game would be Barbarian moves, attacks uh, an adjacent enemy and attacking is never mandatory. Then the opponent moves, to play a game the opponent moves. Uh, well, as best as possible. So it's your game, same thing. You're moving the monsters, trying to catch your barbarian at the best of your possibilities. So you move all the monsters that apply up to the movement allowance. And then monsters that are adjacent to the barbarian may attack. Here in the forest, the goblins will usually try to surround and outnumber the barbarian. They aren't, they aren't very strong, but they can be quite a pain because they can surround the barbarian and prevent movement. And when you are uh, activating monsters for movement, the only monsters that can move are monsters in areas that the Barbarian has visited already. So when the Barbarian moves into a new area, the area is activated and the monsters in there can move for the rest of the game. Again, still only within that area. 
To resolve combat allows simplicity itself, even a little too easy or considerably too easy. The player that is attacking rolls 2d6s for the attacking character. In this case, let's say that the barbarian is attacking. Uh, very few modifiers may apply if the barbarian has found a sword as one uh, under one of those hidden counters, face down counters, then the barbarian gets a plus two. If the barbarian has found a shield, then the enemies attacking the barbarian get get a minus one on the die roll. If in any case your die roll um, equals or exceeds the uh, the defense number of the opponent, which is up there then the attacker inflicts a wound on the target and the wound is recorded on the sheet that I showed you earlier. So yes, uh, goblins or giants attacking, they have exactly the same chance of hitting the barbarian because attack is only based on the defense number of the target and a giant or a goblin inflict exactly the same amount of damage which is one wound, one point of damage, alas. Weird, weird, weird. The game doesn't have a fixed number of turns. The game simply continues until either the barbarian is dead, in which case uh, you, solitaire so gamer, lost the game, or in a two player game, the creature player won the game. The barbarian, in order to win, needs to go around and look for these counters. Uh, two of them are decoys, no, three of them are decoys. And so it's simply they don't mean anything. No, two of them are three of them are decoys. One is a sword and one is the shield. This gives you a bonus in a, when attacking, this when defending, and these are the two items that you are collecting to win the game. One is a curse. If you get the curse, then for the rest of the game you will move at half speed, which means that because of the movement allowance of the of the terrain, in most cases you will only be able to move two axes per turn, which makes the game incredibly slow and tedious. But after going around and looking for these things, and most likely at some point finding the curses, it's just likely that you will find it. You'll win the game as the barbarian if you collected the shield and the sword and you exited the board from one of the two exit from one of the two extremities of the route. Man, do these games show their age? One of them in particular, Barbarian, really shows its age. It seems to be, to be based on, on an idea that is good per se, but is treated in the same shallow way that people treat um, gimmicks. When you see something interesting or treat like a gimmick, then you think that that's all that you need to do. I'll do the gimmick and people will be happy. Here the gimmick being, you are the hero, you're a fantasy hero, travel through uh, fantasy worlds, lay monsters and find stuff. And doesn't look like there was much work done past that. Um, almost the idea is like, well, when I put that, people will be happy. But that is not sufficient, maybe necessary to have a fun adventure fantasy world, but definitely not sufficient because you travel through the world, so you move on this map, you kill monsters, one after the other, one after the other, one after the other, in an extremely tedious, repetitive way, without uh, much control of, of anything, without tactical options, without a sense of real adventure progression that you could have by customizing things, uh, by changing your character, giving the card different skills, different type of tests, deck um, of tests to pass or of, of abilities. Uh, it's a generic barbarian rolling dice against generic enemies and repeating that over and over and over and over again. Even if you win, you don't feel like, hooray, it was so good, it was amazing. You just feel this game, I was lucky, the next game I can play exactly the same with the same level of skill and commitment and you may go completely differently. Very luck-based, very uh, repetitive and linear. Definitely not a game that uh, has many redeeming qualities today when so many better options are available. I guess at the time maybe there was that appeal, that allure of being able to play a D&D kind of game, uh, solitaire, but even back then, if you look at the videos that I released recently in my in my playlist for classic vintage videos, even then at the time of The Barbarian you see that there were already games that gave you a D&D semi type of experience, a quasi D&D experience in a much better way than the barbarian does so it's kind of inexcusable well it's, it's a dot of a game those happen too i'm looking at them historically and so i can tell well historically this game was not particularly interesting not even in its own context 
survival's a little bit better, but maybe it's because I played it together with the barbarians, so maybe that magnified the way to survival a little too much. What it is interesting to me is that it really seems to be almost like a sci-fi re-theming, redesigning of a game by, um, uh, by Avalon Hill that was uh, outdoor survival, a game where you travel on a landscape, on a map, and you roll dice to determine things that happen, your resources go down, you get exhausted along the way, etc, etc, etc. Uh, Other survival is more, it's more detailed um, when it comes to recording your stamina. Um, and it is a game that early on, actually, that was like 1972, introduced the idea of random events. It was the idea that you are here in a parallel world, that the world is realistic, it's outdoor survival in our world, uh, but you will die to determine if you encounter a beast, if you encounter a threat from some other dangerous animals, etc. etc. And imagine how how influential that idea has been um, in gaming, in role-playing gaming, from the you know, wandering tables of monsters that we had since the first edition of Dungeons and Dragons, and in so many gaming. The idea of the random uh, generation of events. Outer Survival may have been one of the first games that did that, and we know that it was through that 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 kind of idea ended being in an element in Dungeons and Dragons. The first edition of Dungeons and Dragons, 1974, acknowledges outdoor survival as one of the sources. Essentially, uh, requires a copy of that game to play Dungeons and Dragons because if you want to play wilderness adventures, so they tell you you use the map of outdoor survival. So as we know that. Uh, mm, Dungeons and Dragons have become really big in the late 70s, have become one of the sources of interest for, for fantasy initially. But then also, Dungeons and Dragons had created the RPG genre, the RPG genre had crossed over from fantasy into sci-fi, so sci-fi games were, were coming out, RPGs, that also is something that triggered an interest for sci-fi, let alone in the late 70s uh, when Star Wars. So came into the mix that was a big interest for fan for, for sci-fi. It seems to me interesting that survival seems somehow to collect all of these threats. Uh, the original idea, so the random tables, so traveling in a hostile landscape from point A to point B that we have in outdoor survival, some of the idea of immersion or playing a, a near a hero in a non-realistic setting that we have in Dungeons and Dragons, um, the sci-fi ideas that we had in role-playing games of the 70s such as Traveler, all of these things go together. It, it, survival has has a less generic flavor to it. It seems to be like a better, more interesting snapshot of what was going on in gaming in the late 1970s. Nevertheless, it is a pretty weak game, but oh, much better than the Barbarian. At least we have some tactical options. At least we get to choose the way we want to attack, the weapons that we're carrying, how many ammo, how much ammo we want to spend in this other action, um, whether we want to attack at a distance, jump into the melee to conserve ammo, do we have some decisions there that make the game still very linear, still very straightforward, but a little bit interesting, a little more interesting with some more flavor and a little more, um, a little more decisions here and there. Still, not a very great game, not a great classic by contemporary standards. You probably never heard of these games before watching this video, and there is a reason why. There's a reason why these were somewhat forgotten. Um, covered by the sense of history, as the sense of history, the sense of time accumulate over everything. And now I am buried them from there to talk to, to you about these games, just to give you like, a little bit of a snapshot to um, get a better sense of what was going on. And I look into these games and I hope for, to find the buried diamond, the game that is still incredibly fresh and playable and enjoyable. Um, I'm not finding it yet, so for now the classics that we know as being classics are the ones from back then that really are still enjoyable, and even those are mainly because they received a couple of facelifts along the way. For games that came out back then, uh, the interest is mainly historical rather than about gameplay per se in a pure sense. Survival and the Barbarian, um, interesting if you will collect this kind of games uh, from back then, uh, interesting for the historian of board gaming and the show of role playing gaming because they clearly have both influenced heavily by that, by then new, uh, by at that time new style of gaming, but other than that not of much interest to anybody else, definitely not of much interest for the, for the regular gamer who just wants to get a good game on the, cable, on the table and have a good time. 
too many better options are available for the regular gamer to uh, make survival and the barbarian of any real interest today.